Welcome to the Photoethics Podcast. I'm your host, Savannah Dodd, and I'm the founder of the Photography Ethics Center. Each week, I'll be talking with an accomplished photographer about the ethics of their practice. Today, in episode number six, we'll be talking with Tara Pixley about critical media production. Tara Pixley is a visual journalist, strategic storytelling consultant, and professor based in Los Angeles, with an MFA in photography, a PhD in communication, and nearly two decades of experience as a media producer and editor for editorial, nonprofit, and commercial organizations. Though she photographs a multitude of subjects for clients and commissions, her personal photographic and scholarly work focuses on rethinking visual representations of gender, race, and sexuality in image making. Tara is on the National Press Photographers Foundation Board and is a co-founder and board member of Authority Collective, an organization dedicated to building community and opportunity for women and non-binary photographers of color. So to get started, I was wondering if you could just tell me a little bit about your work. Yeah, of course. Um, Well, first, thank you so much for having me on today, Savannah. It's really wonderful to uh, be invited to participate in conversations like this. Um, So I am Tara Pixley. I am a freelance visual journalist and a professor of journalism based in Los Angeles. Um, I, I started in journalism with this idea that I was going to be a magazine editor back when I was 15, but I was a real go-getter. So as soon as I decided that I uh, joined the school newspaper, actually helped found and create a school newspaper so that I could be on the school newspaper and um, uh, started doing high school programs and I majored in journalism in college. I have primarily been working in visual journalism for the better part of the last two decades. And my focus has really been trying to reimagine the ways in which we photograph marginalized populations. And that came from a stint I had as a photo editor at Newsweek during the Ferguson protests when the kind of the the beginnings of Black Lives Matter um, as a protest movement was happening around that same time. And I was starting to recognize as the lone Black woman uh, in that newsroom and the only Black person on staff at the time, I was beginning to realize that the ways we as journalists represent marginalized people, Black and Indigenous people especially, and many underrepresented groups is very problematic and it's not holistic storytelling. It's not even necessarily accurate all the time. And it, and it isn't some kind of intentional, um, you know, choice made by the journalists. I mean, it might be sometimes, but for the most part, it's not, it really comes back to there being a lack of representation in the newsroom, a lack of voices that are there to say, Hey, there's more to this story than that, or you didn't think about this aspect of what you're trying to do or the way that you're representing these people visually and writing about in the caption is uh, really misleading. And so it has become my life's work to work uh, to, to kind of address that on different angles. As a as a visual journalist myself, I do work uh, to, or I produce photography and video and writing about photojournalism to address that gap and to tell holistic, accurate stories about marginalized communities. And as an educator, I try to instill this, uh, you know, kind of different way of thinking about the work that we do, or not different, a more expansive way of thinking about the work that we do, bringing in a lot of different ethical questions, recognizing our implicit bias. Those are the things I teach in my my journalism classrooms as a professor at the college level. And um, as a scholar of visual journalism now, I, I got my PhD in communication. And a part of why I did that was so I would be able to teach at the college level and begin to um, help usher in a new generation of really a really diverse, ethically minded and more critically aware journalists and photojournalists 
But I also do research on visual journalism to sort of analyze how do these things happen? What can we do to improve the industry? And how do we educate the populace to be, you know, the public that we serve in telling our stories? How do we actually make them more aware of these different issues so that they can be critical media consumers of the visual, the, the visuals that we, you know, are kind of bombarded with every day. So my work is at these three different intersections and they frequently intersect, which is always lovely. Um, and it keeps me on my toes to be working as both an educator, a scholar and a journalist and being able to speak to all three of those things across those different arenas. There's so much in that. I don't even know where to start, but that's that's really, um, it sounds like a really interesting and uh, quite multifaceted career that you've sort of designed for yourself. I'm I'm quite interested, I guess, in how you <laughs> how do you teach students to be more holistic when they're representing things? Because I guess I'm coming from an anthropology background, and I guess for me, my first my first semester of my anthropology masters totally shredded my entire foundations of self, <laughs> and and that was very useful, you know. Um, but I think that that prepared me in a certain way to be more reflexive and more critical about the things that I'm consuming. Um, but I think that, you know, I, I did that at a master's level. I, I imagine it would be very, it would be much more difficult to encounter that as an undergrad or even younger in high school or something. So I'm I'm curious about how you encourage that kind of shift in thinking um, among your students. Well, you know, actually, the younger we encounter that kind of um, shredding of the sense of self that we have built up over time, the easier it is for our brains to cognitively accept that information. And so it's actually a great failure of our educational systems that we are only invited to become cognizant of our own biases at a college level. Um, this is a this is a whole soapbox. I could go on about this for hours. But, um but really, that's true. Like the a lot, some of the things that I became very interested in was child psychology, neuroscience, and cognitive science when I was studying communication because I kept coming back to how do we make images this way? Like how do we, how are we as journalists often um, really believing in this idea of ourselves as you know pillars of democracy? And um, many of the journalists I've met are just, I would say, most really of the journalists that I've met are really good people who genuinely care about the world and, and telling the stories of our time. And yet we make such terrible decisions and we perpetuate racist mythologies and all of these things. So how does that happen? Well, it, it happens because our social structures are racist, they're sexist, they're heteropatriarchal, right? And those aren't things, those aren't individual choices that we're each making on a daily basis. They're part of systems and structures that we were born into and that we reproduce because we were taught to reproduce it without understanding that's what we were doing. And so we must, I feel, have our students at whatever level we receive them. So, you know, I, if I were talking to kindergarten teachers, I'd be like, excellent, let's talk to our five-year-olds about implicit bias. Um, but as a college professor, that's kind of where I start. I say, hey, you know, you've been looking at news your whole life and you've now you're going to be... Um, making media and maybe you've already started making media and maybe you were like me and made media in high school and weren't thinking about these things then so we have to start addressing who we are what we as individuals bring to our media production because everyone else is going to tell you that you have to take yourself out of it that you're objective but that's actually all bullshit no one can be objective and in fact if we're adhering to this ideal of objectivity, it allows us to do all manner of heinous things because we're not looking very critically at what we're actually producing. However, if we if we flip that, if we say you can't really be objective, there's no such thing as absolute neutrality. But what you can do is dig in really deeply to what you what you are bringing to this. Where do your subjectivities actually lie? What sorts of assumptions are you making when you take an image, when you pick a story, when you write your captions? What sorts of ideas about the world are you playing into without recognizing because you have been invited to ignore those things? And some students take really well to that. Other students are like don't take as well, but 
in my experience, people who are who want to become journalists at this level in their education are actually very open. The sort of like ideology around the hero eyewitness, I think it encourages students to be open to, to things about the world that they don't know. And so encouraging them to start with themselves and to say, in your career as a, as a photographer, as a storyteller, as a journalist, you're going to tell, you know, hundreds of stories. But the first story you have to tell to yourself is the one about you in order to actually tell really important and factual and holistic stories. I'm going to return to the words factual, holistic, and accurate. I just say them over and over again. But yeah, I think that that is that has been my experience in the college classroom. Again, there's so much in that that I want to unpack. This is brilliant. Um, I love what you said about objectivity. And I feel like that's something, I feel like subjectivity is often not a popular thing when talking with people in journalism, has been my experience, that people want to feel that they're able to be objective and that they're able to tell stories in an objective way. Because I think that that's what the industry has really upheld for so long is this, it valued this idea of objectivity. So everything you're saying around um, the, the myth of objectivity really, really resonates with me. Um, again, coming from, coming from an anthropology background. But there's something else that you said there about the idea of the hero as eyewitness. And I was quite curious about that because I find something comes up often and I find it quite problematic about this, um, yeah, this hero image of the photojournalist that can sometimes lead people to do very unsafe things. And I very much think that, that safety is also an ethical issue. And I'm wondering how, you know, you maybe deal with that when you're working with students as well. Well, this is a really tricky, um, it's a tricky thing to think about because I too was uh, kind of brought into photojournalism because I was so enamored of this ideal of the confident white man striding into battle alongside the troops to photograph the atrocities of war and conflict and you know, I, I didn't identify with that, but I wanted to identify with that. And, you know, I'm, I am the child of immigrants. I'm a first generation American. And my parents came to this country from Jamaica uh, under the false pretenses of the American dream, as so many people do, unfortunately, arrive at these shores, <laughs> thinking that it will be one thing when it is quite another. Um, but what is true about that experience is that they wanted me to have a safer life with more opportunities. And so there was something to me that always seemed a little bit wrong about me just sort of turning around, taking all those resources and education I'd received to, you know, improve my opportunities and just run back into conflict zones. And and so I personally decided that was not the route I wanted to take. But what did re- resonate with me was telling the stories of my community, and those aren't the images that we see of, you know, of the um, of the community engaged photographer who cares so deeply about what is happening in their their community, telling the stories of, you know, the mayor's press conference to children playing in the nearby water fountain during a heat wave. Like those are the things that actually um are the foundation of our understanding of our world and our relationship to one another. The whole idea, like the images of conflict, you know, hundreds of thousands of miles away, and those things are incredibly important and those stories need to be told. But there's so much more going on in photojournalism than just that. And so something I came to terms with as a young aspiring photojournalist and something that I teach my students is that, again, the story starts at home. The story is right here. The things that connect us and the things that we need to make visible uh, in our lives and to our our publics, you know, our, our friends, our neighbors, those things are the stories that are happening right where we are. And we need to value those as much as we value understanding a sort of global context, you know, sort of global context of um, what's happening in the world. 
The other problem with that sort of hero eyewitness narrative, and this is the thing that I definitely address, is that it's inherently imperialistic. Anytime we're rushing away to go do something as a journalist, we're assuming that what's happening here, one, doesn't matter, and that what's happening out there is something that we have a right to. And frustratingly, so rarely do we actually tell the story of how American or British or, you know, sort of Western interference politically, socially, et cetera, how those are the reasons why this conflict is happening. And it might be a slow burn from 700 years ago, or it might have happened 10 years ago or 10 minutes. But in my experience of reading (laughs) real world history, of delving into sociology and anthropology and critical cultural studies, what I found is that I was lied to quite a bit about what is happening in the world, or misled rather, and that we as journalists, frankly, need to do better when we're telling these stories. If we want to be that revered eyewitness, if we want to be this hero figure, there's nothing more heroic than uh, writing the wrongs of the past by correctly informing the public about why there is a war in Syria, why this particular nation is in political shambles. You know, those things happen for a reason. They didn't appear out of nowhere. And for us as journalists to appear out of nowhere and be like, ha ha, I have photographed this and I am telling this story and I will bring it back to the Americans so they can understand how messed up everyone else is. Well, that is only part of the story. How did you sort of first come to being vocal about ethics and photography and what led you to that? Was there a particular experience that you had that you thought, right, this is something I need to really dig into and be active about, or um, was it something else? Um, You know, I frequently cite this moment uh, when I was working at Newsweek and I wrote about it in my dissertation and in my Newman Reports article during that um, the time I was working there as a photo editor um, during the Ferguson protests. And I intervened in an editorial choice to publish images of Black men with guns in their waistband in the process of looting a store. And I said, that is not, while that is a thing that is happening, that is not the story of Ferguson. And it would be misleading for us as an international news magazine to publish this photo as representative of the story of Ferguson when what is happening is hundreds of people are amassed outside of that store protesting their right to survive and live under a a brutal police state. And so for us to publish this image of these three men looting a store and imply that that's representative is so problematic, I'm not even sure where to begin. Um, And so I, I often point to that moment as kind of like my aha moment. I was connecting my years as a photojournalist with my, um, at that point I was three years into my doctoral study. And so I'd been introduced to, you know, thinking about when the subaltern can speak and Foucault and all of these different ways of imagining uh, race and how we produce concepts of race and sexuality and gender in our media. And so I was able to articulate something that I had only previously kind of felt weird about and didn't have the words. And I was also in a position, I was working as a contract photo editor. So in my mind, I was kind of like, what are they going to do? Fire me? I, you know, I don't rely on this job. And every other journalism job I'd had up to that moment, I either really relied on it. I you know, I have two children. I was a struggling uh, journalist for a long time because journalists don't make a lot of money. And so I didn't feel like I could speak up like that previously. Um, and so now I was emboldened, able to articulate it, and I had nothing to lose. And so I had this amazing conversation where I said those things and everyone was like, oh, we hadn't thought of that. Sure. Cool. Let's use this other one. It was fine. I didn't have to you know, argue for it. And then that became really the the crux of my dissertation and my work. But actually, before that happened, when I was working at CNN as a photo editor, 
one of the things we had to do was pull various images from the wire every day. Uh, there were three or four of us working as photo editors typically at any time. So we would pull together all of our images from the wire and the director of photography would go through those and pick the, I think, seven to ten that would become the like best images of the day photo gallery. And after doing this a few times, so what we would do is we'd all print out our images, terrible use of paper and dead trees, but we'd print out our images and put them on this big table. And I deeply wish I had taken a photo of this ever. And then the DP would sort through it, pick things out. And I started noticing that one, I was the only, again, uh, the only black female working in this space. There was another uh, black photo editor who was who overlapped with me, but we were rarely on the same shift. So I was often one of four photo editors, all the others white. They frequently picked the same images, like over and over again, it would just happen, the same images. But so I just, you know, I'm kind of noticing this and I was like, what is that about? And that was also an aha moment for me where I was hesitant to think this because I felt like there was something inherently wrong about me thinking that all of these white people were having the same visual narrative and connecting to the same images. But I was finding totally different photos of value on the same wires. We're all pulling from the same space over the same period of time. But it happened so repeatedly that I couldn't help but notice it. And it was just something that kind of stuck in the back of my mind. And when I went to grad school and started, you know, sort of really coming to understand a lot more about how race is constructed and how cognition and implicit bias works, then I really understood. And I started thinking about how that is true across hundreds and thousands of newsrooms, that it's the same kind of people seeing the same way, thinking the same way. And it's not that that way is wrong. There's nothing wrong with the way that they think or see. It just isn't complete. It isn't diverse. It is not encompassing the whole of human experience. And it shows in our images, in our choices. And so we really have to recognize that and push back against it. I think the same thing would be true if it was a room full of, you know, first generation Black Americans. Like maybe we would have the same visual narrative and be pulling the same photos. But this is why diversity is actually incredibly important and why representation matters. We need to have a lot of different viewpoints in the room. We need to value not being surrounded by people who think exactly the same as we do. You said earlier something about... um people being better, um, more critical consumers of media. And this is something that I've thought a lot about. I've, I've brought this up in other, other podcast interviews that, that we've done. And I think I'm really curious to know what, what you think about that. Like, where does viewer responsibility lie? Um, because of course, I guess if you go down the chain, right, like you have the photographers making the work being picked up by the media outlets, but the media outlets are dictating the work that's being created. And then consumption is dictating what things are picked, you know? Um, so it's quite a messy chain of events, I guess, that that it makes me wonder who has the power to really shift the ways that we are representing others. And where does that power lie? And how do we how do we make that shift? Well, there's definitely no easy answer to that. The thing is that we all want to believe that we're special, unique snowflakes that are, you know, some wonderful, intangible combination of our parents' genetic material and our environment, but that we make all of our own decisions. In reality, we are all very similar, um, cognitively very similar. You know, our understanding of the world is actually based along a lot of different tropes and stereotypes. And that's how we make meaning out of the world, whether we realize it or not, even when we're trying, we're working against that. And so if we're all products of, you know, these various systems that were put in play a long, long time ago and have just been replicating themselves, then from children, we're having these ideas reiterated, articulated at an at a subconscious level. So then we become media or we are media consumers from a very young age and we're all consuming a lot of the same media. That media, as you mentioned, you know, it's produced, it's very cyclical. It's produced by people who are thinking the same part of those same systems. Then we become media producers ourselves. And we're doing that from a place of having been produced out of that particular way of understanding the world. And so we reproduce, reiterate 
those same concepts. The only way to stop that process is to recognize that you're in it, right? It's, it's like the matrix. You, you can't affect the matrix so long as you're happily, you know, going about in the matrix. But as soon as we take a step back and we say, okay, my relationship to this story is coming from this, you know, way that I have of engaging the world. And that way I have of engaging the world is tied to a very long understanding of race and gender and sexuality and the people in this community and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, on and on. I have to make an intentional intervention into my way of thinking to produce this media in a different way. And the reason why I'm, I'm, I'm kind of returning to that, um, example is that your question about media consumption, we are as media makers, also media consumers. You know, there is really no line there. And none of us are ever really being taught uh, in a very serious, intentional way, and certainly not from a young age, how to be critical media consumers, because it doesn't benefit any structures of power for their citizenry to be well-educated, critical thinkers. It never has, it never will, right? As soon as we start critically thinking and understanding the world around us, then we are like, hey, that that's a problem. And that's also a problem. And why are you doing that? So we're not taught to be critical or reflexive. And then we grow up consuming media uncritically, unreflexively. And it just, again, reproduces those ideas. It's, it's, um, confirmation bias. So we have this idea about the world and then we go and seek out information that validates that idea about the world. And then whenever someone else says, no, no, I have a different idea about the world. You're like, no, no, look at all of this information I got that validates my way of seeing the world. Check it out. So it just, we're doing that over and over again. So where does the responsibility lie with all of us, right? It's, We can't, as media producers, just somehow stop that cycle. Even if all the newspapers and magazines and, you know, if all the news organizations in the world tomorrow started telling these really, really complex and and, uh, holistic stories, the public would be like, whoa, 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 what's happening? You're having some kind of fascist socialist takeover where you think that the, the lived experience of black and brown people is valid. What are you doing? This is a, honestly, I think it has to be like, I mean, I hesitate to say slow process, but it is a process. It is an intentional intervention. It has to start at multiple different points. We have to start teaching children how to be critical consumers of media. We have to continue that lesson or that you know way of um, approaching and thinking about the information and ideas you're consuming and circulating. We have to continue that way of thinking about it through college. And, and then we as media makers have to really start contend with the problematic ideas and ideologies that we're constantly propping up. It it all has to happen together because I don't think I actually was just talking to a photo editor working uh, really hard to tell new stories about indigenous people and black and brown people and reflect the the experiences and, and knowledge of the community that this news organization serves. Their audience is primarily white. The place in which they are speaking to that audience is not only white and their white audience was is very antagonistic to this new coverage they're saying you know I, I'm not going to subscribe to this anymore why are you focusing so much on indigeneity and and these black lives matter protesters so you know that's really it's kind of like a quick case study that shows people don't like to hear new information that conflicts with what they've decided to believe and been told to believe their whole lives. So how do we do that work? We have to do it together. We have to realize it's happening. And we can't just sort of um, fall back into this, well, it's not my responsibility as a journalist to educate the populace. And, you know, it's not my responsibility as a consumer to check that the information I'm circulating on Twitter is factually correct. No, dude, it's actually all of our responsibilities because we're all in this together and we're ruining it collectively. That really... (laughs) resonates as well with um, cause some conversations I've had when working with people who produce communications materials in the humanitarian and development sector, which, you know, there's this question a lot of times that like, well, 
we have to show what the donors expect and like whose responsibility is it to educate the donors? It's not our responsibility to educate the donors. If the donors want to see something and we want to be able to continue to provide for this community, then we have to show, you know, the community that we're serving in a very particular light, which is often really, really steeped in stereotypes. So I think, yeah, that, that idea that, you know, it can't just be fobbed off onto, onto another, uh, cog in the wheel it's it's you know everybody has to has to make that shift and take initiative in that way I think that that is very yeah, yeah. good for everybody <laughs> to hear <laughs> so. yeah absolutely and that's you know that kind of goes back to this frustration that I always have you know I'll often be at parties and people are like the media is doing da 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 the media and I'm like hi the media here I I, I just wanted to check in because you're saying I'm doing this thing and you know, and the thing it's I'm joking but the thing there is that we we so deeply want to believe that everything that is bad in our lives is just some like external institution and while it is absolutely true that as i said stated previously we're all part of uh you know these institutions and structures that were created a long time ago to cr- produce capitalism and keep it going that is actually accurate, but those institutions are actually made up of each of us. We are actively every day reproducing those institutions and our choices. It's not some external thing. We never want to contend with our own responsibilities as individuals. The thing about the media is that it is comprised of a bunch of individuals. And when people say the media is showing this in this way, or, you know, the media is whatever the media is doing on a Tuesday, but actually the media is your neighbor, your mother, me, your friend, the person at that party. We're just journalists. We're, we're just producing content for you, the audience that we believe you want because you confirm that with your consumption of media. And so it is this entirely reciprocal relationship where News media reflects the the public it serves. And a lot of times that public doesn't like that view. We don't want to believe that we are, you know, basic people. People are like, stop covering Trump. Stop clicking on Trump articles. Uh, they're, they're going to keep doing that, right? Because they have to they have to pay their staff to continue to produce other things. And if you only care about, you know, some stupid clickbait and you're not actually showing that you genuinely care about long form investigative journalism, you know, th- this is actually partially on you. Like we're, we're producing content that you respond to. So if you want to see better things and have better things, you want the media to stop the media, right. To stop producing clickbait content, then stop clicking on it. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I guess in the photojournalism online ether, of conversations that are happening. Um, It seems like there have been quite a number of uh, hot button issues that have come up in the past few months. And I was wondering if you wanted to comment in any way on um, the many different sort of developments that I feel like on one hand, it's very disconcerting, the things that are coming up. But on the other hand, I'm really excited that people are getting so fired up over photography ethics issues. <laughs> so it's um, it's sort of, yeah, a double-edged sword, I guess, uh, for me. But but yeah, is there anything that you'd sort of like to weigh in on? <laughs> so many things I'd like to weigh in on. Um, <laughs> you know, one of the things I think that's really interesting about this photography ethics conversation that we are in the midst of currently is that it's really laying bare the lack of media literacy in the public sphere and the lack of reflexivity and critical understanding of their work in the traditional photojournalist sphere. And I say that because my understanding of this sort of, you know, ethical argument started with a a call from, from the public, from protesters and activists saying, please stop showing the faces and I, and, you know, publishing the identities of protesters, you're putting black and brown protesters in danger. At its core, I think that is a really valid critique and concern. But asking journalists to blur the faces of people in their photographs is in many ways refuting the validity of photojournalism. 
if our goal is to help people who, you know, the people who aren't at the protest, the people who don't understand why this is happening, people in other countries who, uh, you know, are, are watching this and trying to to understand what what this all means. Our goal as photojournalists is to inspire that empathetic response or to inspire that level of connection and and recognition of of shared humanity. You can't do that with a blurred face. You you can't do that when you see an image of people, you know, marching down the street but they're all just blobs. That photo becomes irrelevant. You know, maybe this would be an interesting art piece in a and I'm sure it's forthcoming in some exhibit where all the images of protesters are just blurred blobs. Um, and there is certainly some commentary, some social commentary in there, but that's not photojournalism. And so this, you know, demand from audiences to do that indicates they don't really understand what photojournalists are supposed to be doing. Um, and then the knee-jerk response of traditional, um, you know, I, I keep searching for a word to explain this group of people. It's the primarily white, primarily male generation of photojournalists who weren't ever asked to think critically about themselves or their job. They just, you know, ran into battle with their camera and then got pats on the back in the form of awards. Great job. Go do it again. And there are certainly some voices among that generation that are allied with this particular way of imagining themselves in the world that's real problematic and, again, not reflexive. Um, those people are terrified of having... They're terrified of being asked to do something they haven't done before. They're terrified of being invalidated. And they're scared of something that is very real, which is that public trust in all journalists is at an all-time low. Demagogues are railing against journalism. You know, they're trying to tear down journalism because they're trying to tear down democracy and journalism is a pillar of democracy. And as long as you have a misinformed or uninformed public, you can do a lot of heinous fascist things, as history has shown us. And so, you know, I don't fault that that group um, of people who are being very antagonistic to the idea of even even thinking about uh, the importance of minimizing harm to marginalized communities. I understand their fear as a journalist myself, but th those things are actually cyclical, right? So when you have people who refuse to recognize uh, that their role as journalists is actually harmful, that what they're doing and producing is a reiteration of these racist and and sexist and imperialist ideologies. When they're they're doing that, their whole career, they're just, you know, over and over again. The public recognizes that. Then the public that doesn't see themselves represented correctly in, in these images doesn't understand the importance of journalism because their experience of it is that it's problematic and again, not representative of their experiences, then they have less trust. Then they care less when those photojournalists are blinded by police, you know, harassed, having all of these scary, violent things visited upon them. And so that there's this huge disconnect there where actually, if we were listening to each other, if the public was listening to the photojournalists and the photojournalists were listening to the public and everyone was engaged in this conversation where I'm going to do this job of of reflecting the reality of the world to you and, and get into places that you can't access so that I can do my job as a journalist and, and, and inform you about the world. And, you know, in turn, I will care about this ask to minimize harm in our communities. But those things aren't happening. And then you have this middle group, <laughs> the one to which I belong, of primarily, uh, you know, of a kind of new generation of photographers and photojournalists who are, is much more diverse, who has had the privilege of a lot more education and who is actually very reflexive or trying to be reflexive and is trying to find that middle ground. You know, I care about First Amendment rights. Of course I do. I don't want to lose my First Amendment rights as an American. It's been drilled into me since I was a child. One of the things I had to do in my journalism classroom was memorize the First Amendment and then take a quiz on it. So like, obviously, this is something I care about. And of course, I as a journalist also don't want to be minimized and devalued in the eyes of the government such that 
I can be arrested and harmed or killed in the process of doing my job. I just happen to be of the opinion that I can both hold on to my First Amendment rights and minimize harm as I'm utilizing those rights. I believe that I have rights and responsibilities to my public. That just because you can do something because it's your legal right doesn't actually mean you should do that thing. Even beyond all of that, the thing that I find incredibly disturbing about this particular uh, ethical argument is that the very people who are so willing to run into battle, to photograph the Vietnam War, you know, the Syrian War, you know, who are the first ones there when there's a, a devastating hurricane or earthquake, they're doing that under the auspices of telling the important stories of marginalized people of under-resourced, underrepresented, um, you know, people who are basically having the worst experiences of their lives due to this conflict, war, catastrophe, disaster, insert thing here. And they believe that that is an important and valid thing for them to do. And yet, the second that those marginalized groups speak back to them and say, that's not what we want you to do. That's actually not what we need from you. They're livid they're aghast. How dare they? How dare they attack my right to photograph them? How dare they attack my right to be here and tell your stories so that you are, you know, have a better life. And that, you know, it's such an inherently illogical response that it's mind blowing to me to see people make that argument over and over again publicly. (laughs) Like, you know, they're posting this on Facebook and Twitter and I'm just like, wow, you're really incredibly not understanding what you're saying. Um, and so it's it's really sad. It's really disappointing. And I think it's really unfortunate that we are airing that ignorance publicly for the public whose trust in us is so unfortunately degraded for all of those people to see and have confirmation that the news media is in fact misrepresenting them, not listening to them, not caring. And they are actually aligning themselves in this sort of like uh, cabal of the news media, right? As like, no, we have the right to photograph you in the streets so that we can tell everyone how upset you are about what white people are doing to you and not see the irony that you are the white person who is doing this thing or you're, you're white adjacent, you're white aligned, like <laughs> you're making really poor choices uh, along a sort of white patriarchal heteronormative understanding of the world. So could you say maybe um, then how do you view the way forward then? I guess for that for that third group, you know, what is the way to reconcile these things? Um, well, I am of the sensibility that you fight, you know, hate speech and, and wrongheaded speech with more speech. And so that's why I do podcasts like this. That's why I keep writing. That's why I work with Authority Collective as an advocate for women and non-binary photographers or visual storytellers of color, because I think that the time of those people who are uncritical, who are unreflexive, who are rigid in their understanding of the world and unwilling to listen to the audiences, the communities that they are supposed to be serving, I believe their time is over, or it's, it's certainly on its way out. And We then have the choice of what we will replace those ways of working and understanding the world with. I think part of that is our responsibility to open as many doors as we can for the next generation of visual storytellers. You know, I'm I'm 37 years old. When I was 20 and 21 and 22, and when I was a young aspiring photojournalist and getting into the business and working as a full-time photojournalist at the Greenville News in South Carolina, I had some really bad things said to me and done to me by my colleagues, uh, by the people in that community that I was photographing and attempting to serve. And I want for no one who looks like me to have to experience that. I want the next, you know, 20 year old black woman to walk into a newsroom with her camera flung over her shoulder and confidently feel that she is welcome there, that her perspective matters and will be recognized, that the stories she tells will be just as important as her white or male colleagues. And that's the work that I'm doing. 
And I think that along the way, I also try to help bring this other generation of photojournalists to the table. I try to help have those conversations with them, even though they're antagonistic and attacky <laughs> and all these other things. And, and that work is, you know, it's not easy and it's uncomfortable for everyone, but I think that is the way forward. We have to, again, instill critical media literacy in our college students, in our high school students. We have to really build that into the journalism core education. And we have to begin to address the institutions that support these problematic ideologies. We have to think about what are our photo awards doing? What are what are these big institutions that we all want so badly? The New York Times, Wall Street Journal, National Geographic, Rolling Stone. We all grow up thinking, oh, my God, if I can just get published in those pages. What is an alternative to that kind of approach where we will do anything to be validated by these institutions? What if we demand those institutions recognize the validity of us? And what does that look like? So... That, I think, is the way forward. It's just, it's really this sort of collective, collaborative, and critical work that understands we're never done learning, we're never done doing the work, and that ultimately, this is not about us being cool photographers with great gear that gets access to the whole world. It's actually about us telling difficult and important stories wherever we can, and that might be down the street. And that is just as important, if not in many ways more important than jumping on a plane with our camera to show how cool and valid we are as eyewitnesses. There's one thing that I'd like to ask you that I ask everybody um, on the podcast, and it's a, kind of a broad question, but I was wondering if you could just tell me, what does photography ethics mean to you? Photography ethics, to me, means an opportunity for me to reckon with that space betwixt responsibility and rights. The ethics of photography is an opportunity for me to constantly reassess and reimagine what it is I'm doing as a photographer, as a photo editor, as a scholar of visual journalism. Like what ideas am I producing in the world and how am I treating people as I produce those ideas? One of the other things you asked me earlier, um, like what led me to thinking about photography in this way? And there's actually this one thing that happened very early on that I keep returning to mentally. I was uh, a student fellow at the New York Times Student Institute in 2005 in New Orleans, three months before Katrina changed that city and in many ways changed my relationship to journalism. And part of my training as part of that institute was to just sort of go out into the streets of New Orleans, walk around, and, you know, I was feature hunting, essentially. And I wandered into this one neighborhood. I, I don't know exactly where I was. Like, I was very young. I think I was 21 or 22 at the time. And I saw this little girl, a young Black girl. She was a toddler, like maybe two or three years old. And she she was partially naked. She was running around barefoot. Her hair was really messy and she was just kind of standing there staring at me. And so I took a picture of her and I had this just really weird thing where she's looking at me and I'm looking at her. I'm kind of looking around like, where's your mother or, or your parents rather? Um, but something inspired me to take this photo. And then I went back, you know, to look at my take and, and that image was, there was nothing special about it. It was just a little black girl, a, a disheveled black girl. And I started thinking, why did I take that photo? Like what, what inspired me to think that this was a moment I needed to capture? And I didn't really have a good answer for that. But I, again, kept returning to it years and years and years later. And I know now that the reason why I took that photo is because I had been primed to believe there was something inherently interesting or important about photographing an impoverished Black child. And that I was replicating this particular way of seeing and understanding the world because I thought that's what I was supposed to do. Even though, even though I myself have been that child. And so photography ethics for me 
is the space for us to come to terms with so many things that is wrong with the world and how we see. And there's no more important time for us to begin contending with those ideas than right now. Because every little child out there deserves to be actually seen and have real stories told about them. And not just photographed because they're barefoot and poor and black. Yeah. No, absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing that that anecdote. I think that's extremely powerful and really important for people to hear and to think about, um, as you said, especially uh, especially now. Is there anything else that I haven't asked you, but should have asked you, and anything else you'd like to you'd like to share? Um, I really appreciate your interest in having this conversation and that there is a photography ethics center, you know, and I just, I want to say that we, we need to stay with the trouble. We need to keep having those uncomfortable conversations and keep reckoning with our own relationship to images and what it means to make a photo, what sorts of privileges you know, what sorts of privileges are afforded for us to be able to make any image, to be at the site or the space where we photograph people and places. An extension of that, you know, if it is a privilege to photograph, to be present, to be able to be here and do this work, then what responsibility do we have to the work, to the image, to the people in the photograph, to everyone who is watching, everyone who is consuming those photos? Because we are all part of this cyclical, again, understanding of the world. And so what part do you actually want to have in that? And so that's what I think as sort of my my parting um, idea is that it's so important and so valuable and actually just such a privilege to be able to be a photographer. And so I want to never lose sight of, of that responsibility because as soon as I lose sight of that, I don't deserve that privilege. Thank you very much for listening to this episode of the Photo Ethics Podcast. The aim of this podcast is to share new insights about photography ethics with others. So if you heard something you liked, please share this podcast with someone who would appreciate it. The links to all things mentioned in this episode number six are available in the show notes at www.photoethics.org. Join me next week when we hear from Jess Crombie on storytelling partnerships.